Welcome home, my little hellhounds. Tonight we have one scary story to sink our hellish teeth into. If you like scary stories, then don't forget to subscribe and click the like button. And don't forget to ring the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, let's get right into it. Little Anne Marie, written by me. Tonight, on the 11 o'clock news, we have a sad story. It was here in Central Park, near this old oak tree, that little six year old Anne Marie disappeared nearly five years ago. To this day, her parents hold on to the hope that she will be found or come home. Tonight at midnight there will be a candlelit vigil and a silent prayer to keep their hope alive that she may one day return home safe and sound. Sam, will you turn that TV off and help me with these t-shirts? Okay, okay, give me a minute. Are you sure you want to use this picture on the shirts, Diane? Yes, of course I do. She is smiling, her hair is in a ponytail, and she is almost glowing. Besides, it was the last picture we took of her. Can you load these into the car now, please? Okay, I'll take them to the car but can you put the kettle on? Oh sure, do you want your coffee? Oh, that will do. He smiled caringly at me, for the first time in a while now. A few minutes later, Sam returns to find his freshly made coffee and sits at the shaky dining room table. I am clutching at Anne-Marie's picture but he says nothing. He knows not to say anything and leave me deep in my thoughts. Anne-Marie's disappearance destroyed us, almost destroyed our marriage. Sometimes I think we stayed together because maybe she won't come home if we split up. But we are getting through it, starting to show how we feel again. I hear Sam's nervous voice behind me. Come on, love. We need to get to the park. I want to yell at him for disturbing me, but deep down I know he is right. I kiss Anne-Marie's picture and place it back on the mantel. I walk in silence to our run-down Ford Escort, with paint chipping on one side and a flickering headlight. It's a miracle it hasn't broken down yet. The drive to the park seems to take forever, whereas it is only 20 minutes away. As we pull into the park, we have to go down a horrible dirt road. I'm not even sure if this car can take another trip down this road. When we get to the parking space, we're greeted by hundreds of soaking wet people. They must have been standing here in that last downpour. It has cleared up now, but the heavy dark clouds are still covering most of the night. Sky. Just as I glance up, I notice one bright star blinking in the sky. I smile slightly. At least one angel is looking down on us. 
As we walk through the prim and proper cut grass, I notice I have a hole in my shoe. Looking down at my feet, I murmur, just what I needed. At that moment, I hear someone calling us from behind. Hiya, Diane, Sam. How are things with you two? It was the park ranger, Dave, in his green, well-ironed uniform and crew-cut hair. He was part of the original search party and has become a good friend to Sam. We're okay, Dave. Thank you for organising this each year and keeping her in people's thoughts. It's no problem at all. Would you be able to hand out these t-shirts for us, Dave? I don't think I can face hearing how everyone feels and how sorry they are. Of course I can. I can do anything to help, Diane. He hands us each an LED candle. I suppose it's safer for the kids around. I feel like everyone is looking at us, watching us with sadness in their eyes. Everyone is saying that they're sorry and still praying for her safe return. But it is of little comfort. It doesn't get her home. As we walk through the park, I notice how damp the air is but it isn't horribly damp, more refreshing. Summer is nearly here. Now that we have eventually passed by everyone and have finally got to the front, I look up and see a podium with the mayor ready to give his long speech. Thank you everyone for attending tonight so we can show Sam and Diane that we are still hoping and looking for little Anne-Marie. As he mentions her sweet name, it brings back so many memories of that day. How the weather was, how she made us laugh, even the peanut butter sandwich she had. She was such a sweet little girl, always ready to make me smile. She was so polite, oh, so polite. But the most magical thing about her was her soft, enchanting singing voice. I still sing by her bed, hoping she will walk through her bedroom door. My eyes start to well up as my emotions start to take hold. Next up is the vicar to start the prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Please keep watch on our little Anne-Marie. I lower my head and listen to Father Daniels, but I get distracted. The hairs on the back of my neck begin to stand up on end. That's when I hear it. A whisper, almost in my ear. A breath on my neck. But it is so faint, I can't quite make it out. I whip my head around to see that there is nothing there. The evening comes to an end and all our friends and neighbours begin to go home with sad smiles on their faces. I turn to ask Sam, did you hear that whisper? It was as Father Daniels was praying with us. It sent a chill down my spine. No love, what whisper? Oh, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Look, it's getting late, let's just go home. I am exhausted. After a short but silent drive home, we pull into the driveway and without a word, we go into the house. I hate these silences. Each year, I always get a feeling after each vigil that Sam is hiding something from me, something important. I go straight to the drinks cabinet, old dark pine glass doors with one of the magnets missing, so it just partly closes. An heirloom from his dad, I think. I reach for a bottle of red and pour a big glass 
ready for my book. A nice romance novel so I can escape this world and go somewhere far, far away where I'm alone. Oh, the solitude. Sam put his sports on the TV. Will you turn that down? I'm trying to read. For Christ's sake, I'm off to bed. Good night. Night. God damn it. I launch my book across the sofa. I think I'll close my eyes just for a few minutes, then go up and see if he's okay. I don't mean to get so cross with him. It's not his fault. I just wish he would tell me what he's hiding. Mummy, why are you sad? Help me. Save me. I wake with a start that sounded just like Anne-Marie, scared and shaking with tears streaming down my face. I feel I need a cuddle. So I down my glass of wine, screwing up my face a little with the bitterness and rush up to bed. As I creak open the door, I see that Sam is fast asleep on the bed, snoring his head off. I push him over and climb in. I can feel the soft warmth of the bed and the comfort of having him so close again. Then I reach my arm over him. I am sorry, honey, I whisper in his ear. I begin to feel worried that I'm driving him away. I treat him so bad, snap at him for the least little thing, and yet he still puts up with me. At the same time, I feel obsessed that he knows something or is hiding something. Is it another woman? Does he know more about my daughter's disappearance? I can't seem to shake these thoughts, these feelings. What shall I do? Shall I confront him and risk it going completely wrong and him walking out on me? Although, who could blame him? I soon fall asleep only to see her face and hear her. Mummy, why? I love you, Mummy. Please don't be cross with me. It continues all night long and I wake every couple of hours shaking and crying. Beep, beep. Ugh. Damn alarm clock. It feels so loud this morning. A long yawn leaves my body in a shaky stretch. Then I say, Morning Sam, I'm sorry about last night. I lean over only to find he's already up. I suppose I better get dressed and see what reception I get when I go down to the kitchen. As I glance out the window, I notice it's like summer bright and warm, people going about their business in shirts and shorts, I envy their normal life when my own has a huge gap in it, they have no worries since they still have their full lives, their partners, their kids, their jobs, everything, I don't mean or want to be like this, it's just the way I feel. Oh well, I cannot put it off any longer. I have to go down. I tread down slowly, wondering, shall I ask what he's hiding or just apologise? Just apologise, that's a start. He's in the kitchen, still treading softly. I walk in, only to see Dr Anderson sitting next to him at the table, chatting away. Morning, honey, Sam quietly says. I meekly say, Hello, Dr. Anderson, why are you here? Did you forget again, Diane? I am here to give you your injection of vitamin B12. Oh yeah, I pretend. I remember, but honestly, I don't. Regardless, I roll up my right sleeve. This may sting a bit. 
Ouch. It feels like he just stabs it in me. I can feel the reddish brown liquid course up the inside of my arm. Who knew just by being given my vitamins it would hurt so much. That's it Diane, all done. I'll see you next month. And don't worry, I'll see myself out. I look at Tam while rolling my sleeve back down. Can we talk? Oh, now you want to talk, Diane. He snaps back, without missing a beat. I've been trying to talk to you for a very long time. And you shun me at every attempt. Well, it's not been easy for me either, Sam. But I do try. That's easy for you to say. But what about me? You have no idea what I have done for you. What do you mean, Sam? Forget it. Look, it's in the past. No, I know you are hiding something. Look, Diane, I'm late for work now. So we will talk about this later. That's it. Storm off as you always do. Bang. I hate it when he slams the door like that. It worries me that he's going to pull the door off its hinges. Oh well, some chat that turned out to be. At least he has made me a coffee. Mummy. I whip around. Anne-Marie, is that you? No, of course not. I am in here on my own again. I'm starting to think I'm going crazy. I'm seeing her in my sleep now. Now I'm hearing her while I'm awake. Ouch. Too soon to sip my coffee as I burn my lip and tongue. I hate that. Without thinking, I begin to pace around the kitchen and living room, trying to figure out what I should do next. I know he's trying to hide something. Otherwise, why would he have said that? I have no idea what he's done for me. As far as I can tell, he's done nothing but be a layabout since Anne-Marie's disappearance. All he does is work, eat and sleep. Never any time for me or our marriage. Yeah, he does the odd sweet thing, like make me my morning coffee each day. But that's about it. He doesn't take me out. But it's worse around this time of year. I know he's hurting, but I'm hurting too. I decided it's time to find out what he's hiding. First is top drawer and I know where he keeps the key. Off to be Detective Sleuth. As I open the bedroom door, I remember the envious feeling I felt yesterday, but I shake it off. I then lift the mattress up on his side and bingo, so predictable. Now I have the key, let's open his secrets up. Surprise, surprise, a man with dirty magazines. I shove them over, out the way. Clunk, what was that? A long jewellery box, the type that holds a necklace or a bracelet. Hesitantly, I open it up. It's empty. Now, did he give it to someone or remove it because I knew he was hiding something? I quickly shove everything back, but keep the box. I think I'll decide how I'm going to handle this later. I better hide the key again. As I sit on the bed, box in hand, I wonder is my marriage completely over? No. I will not let it be. I will not lose my daughter and my husband. I can't lose someone else again. I close my eyes and feel the stress and tiredness within me. Don't be sad, mummy. Sharply, I open my eyes and look round the room. Yet again, I am alone. What's happening to me? Why now? Why am I hearing her now, not before? I need to get out, go for a walk, 
clear my head. Yes, that's what I need. So on with my trainers and off to... Um, I'm not too sure. But as long as I'm out, I can't see that it matters where I go. As I walk down the drive, I approach the end and realise I don't know my own town anymore. It's been so long since I've been out. So I just start randomly walking, trying to clear my head and stop thinking about all my problems. Chance would be a fine thing. I sarcastically whisper to myself. Mummy, when we get to the shops, can I have a sweetie? Not now. Please, not now. I pick up the pace, seeking silence and solitude. I walk a few paces into a field and sit down on the hard ground and just look at the dandelions and the dandelion clocks. I reach out to pick one and begin to blow and count as a child would. One, two and three. Wow, three blows. I used to do that in one blow. As a kid, I suppose it's age. I begin to wonder how long it has been since I left the house just to go to the shops for a walk. I used to jog every day and go for long walks. It feels like I only go to Anne Marie's vigils now and that's it. Now the nerves start to kick in and I wonder if Sam has kept me in intentionally or not. More importantly, why am I going crazy hearing these voices? What do I do? A sudden chill passes through me. I look up at the sky and see heavy clouds crowding over me. It's getting dark. The wind has picked up as well. So I decide to get up and start walking towards the road and head home. I have to talk to him and find out why he's hiding the box. Also, how he's managed to keep me indoors all this time and no one has said or done anything about it. Or have they? And just my luck, just as I reach the path home, the heavens open up. Cold rain quickly soaks my hair, but luckily I decided to bring my coat. I stopped dead in my tracks. It finally dawns on me. All this time I have hoped and prayed that Anne-Marie will come back safe and sound. But now my chest is tightening. I can't breathe. I collapse to the floor and cry like I've never done before. I then scream, she's dead. That's why I can hear her. Diane, you okay? I look up with tear soaked eyes, looking a real mess. Leaning out of the window of his car is Dave, the ranger. No, I'm just a bit lost. Actually, can you give me a lift? I could do with a chat. Of course, I can hop in. Thank you. As I get in, I notice the smell of fresh leather and the faint smell of pine air freshener he has hanging from the rear view mirror. So Diane, what can I help you with? Well, um, it's Sam. He's hiding something from me. Wow, right into it. How do you know that? He quickly replies. Just a feeling. Has he said anything to you? No, nothing. But remember, he has done a lot for you. Protected you from... Protected me from what? I argue back. Nothing, nothing. Forget it. How can I forget that? He hasn't done much. Just work, eat, sleep. And why does he storm off? Here we are, safe and sound. What? I look up. We're home already. As I get out, 
I realise it's now really warm and sunny. No rain, no clouds, just a warm glow of the sun. Yep. Have a good day and don't forget to talk to Sam. He's the one you should get the answers from. But remember how he protected you. I scoff at his comments. He's done nothing for me. I glance at my watch and see 5.15. Oh no, he'll be home in 15 minutes. I rush indoors and put the box back where I found it. I have to think about this rationally before I jump to conclusions and I better get dinner on. Beef, I think. I'll act like today didn't happen and see what he says before I start. But either way, I need to know why he and Dave think he's protected me. What are they hiding? About 30 minutes later, like clockwork, Sam walks in. Something smells good. No hello or how are you? Just straight to the food. Typical man. Yeah, I'm making your favourite. Medium rare beef in gravy with new potatoes and beans. Did you have a good day at work? I ask, pretending I'm interested. No, the new boss was riding my ass all day. I'm slightly behind on the health and safety reports, but I can't see why I can't have help or split the workload. Maybe, but how long did they give you to do the reports? He gave me till the end of next week. I'm starting to feel bored now. I just want to ask him about everything, but I can't bring myself to do it. I had an interesting day. I went for a walk. I can't remember the last time I went out. Feeling proud of the fact that I just went out. Silly, I know. His face dropped, as if I just stabbed him or something. He looked terrified and angry all at the same time. What did you just say? Yep, definitely angry, but I'm an adult. If I want to go out, I can. Yeah, but not too far, just the fields a couple of miles down the road. I'm allowed out, you know. Yes, love, I know. I'm just trying to protect you. Yes, yes, so you and Dave keep telling me. But what are you trying to protect me from? Dave, what did he say? He quickly questions. The exact same as you. That you have been protecting me. But he will not tell me what from. Now I'm feeling cross and angered by him. So are you going to tell me what you are protecting me from? I'm going out. I don't have to explain myself to you. Just as always, out he goes. I will find out, I shout after him, as I tip his dinner in the bin. He can starve tonight, for all I care. Mummy, can I have a glass of water? Now, I'm trying to ignore my own daughter's voice. What is wrong with me? If I talk to her, I feel weird, and if I don't, I feel cruel. I feel like I cannot win. I begin to pace the room like I always do when I'm emotional, but I don't realise I'm doing it for a while. When I do, it makes me feel worse. Why does he keep walking out on me when I'm talking to him? I just want to know What is worth hiding from me all this time? I know, I'll call Dave to see if I can get something out of him. As I pick up the phone, it dawns on me. He wasn't really ready to talk to me earlier. So I slam the phone down. Instead, I decide to grab my book, a nice tall glass of wine, and wait till he gets home. 
then I'm going to block his exit and demand answers. Some time passes and I hear his car pull up. Time to down the wine and face the music. Well, you're back then. The sarcasm rolls from my mouth. Yeah, can we just calm down and watch the game? I shift between him and the front door and fold my arms, trying to be as stern as possible. Well, we can watch the game as soon as you explain everything. Explain what? That I give you everything you want and protect you. You don't protect me from anything. I cook, clean, I do everything while you work and sleep. He scoffs at my remarks, not changing his stone-looking face. I protect you, look after you. You're being so ungrateful. Out of nowhere, crack right across my face, the hardest slap I've ever had. He knocks me to the ground. I lay there holding my face. I can feel my face begin to burn red and begin to swell. I look up and see him leering over me. I've never seen this look before. He looks like he is going to beat me or even worse, kill me. Then it hits me harder than he ever could. Did you do it? Did you kill my little Anne-Marie? His eyes burn bright red like hellfire. He then just sits next to me on the floor and shockingly cries. I could never hurt her, ever. In fact, it was. Who? Tell me who. After a long pause, I'm listening to him cry as if he's the victim. I'm the one with a swollen face and burning cheek, yet he's the one that's crying. No, it's not right. I can't. Are you okay, mummy? Yes, darling. Go back to bed while mummy and daddy are talking. Diane, who? Who are you talking to? There's no one there. Damn, I just realised what I have done. Now he's going to think I'm crazy and probably use it against me. So I jump up, do a 180 and run upstairs. Sitting on the floor of my bedroom against the door, I sob. I miss her so very much. I can't stop thinking about her. Maybe that's why I keep hearing her, holding my face in my hands. I hear, please mummy, don't cry. I uncover my face only to see the brightest white light I've ever seen. So bright that I have to cover my eyes slightly. Just as I am about to say something, it goes dark again. I reach my arm out. No, please, don't go. I need you. Bang. Bang. I feel the door move against my back. Let me in, Diane. I am sorry. I didn't mean to hit you. It will never happen again. Go away. I don't want you near me. Not until you tell me everything you know. And what Dave knows. Thick of thieves. You too. Look, Diane. I am sorry. For some reason, I begin to feel guilty, thinking all these bad feelings about him. I know he hit me, but I have been pushing him. What I can't get my head around is why my feelings seem to bounce all over the place. One minute, I'm sure he's killed her. The next, I feel bad for him, and a strong feeling of guilt rushes over me. I'm fed up with all this sadness and uncertainty. I feel like I'm living in a black hole with no end in sight. Mummy, I can make you feel better. How, baby, how can you make 
all this better. Come with me, mummy. Diane, who are you talking to? He calls through the door. I almost forgot he was there. Um, no one. I quietly answer, not even sure if he hears me. I rub the sadness away from my eyes and decide to open the door. As soon as the door opens, he lunges at me and wraps his arms around me tight, apologising in a hundred and one different ways. Look, I know you are sorry and you try to look after me. I just want you to open up to me. Okay, let's talk. I'll tell you everything. I walk over to the bed, glancing out the window and seeing everyone going about their business. The feeling of envy creeps over me again. So, Diane, what do you want to know? What happened to Anne-Marie? Why don't I go out? Is Anne-Marie dead? <sighs> right he replies and begins pacing the floor for once I can see true emotion and expression look Diane it is complicated right yes Anne Marie is dead it was a freak accident she fell down that deep ditch behind the old oak tree Although it was a freak accident, I thought people would blame me. So I talked to Dave and he helped me hide the body. Tears now streaming down his eyes. I can feel the fire of rage coursing through my veins. I hold back my fists and tears for now. Okay, so why can't I seem to remember that day properly? And why can't I remember the last time I went out? Well, the thing is, when you saw... Um, well, when you... The thing is... Oh great, now he's stumbling on his words. Spit it out. I can feel the impatience now spewing from my mouth. Well, um... When you saw Anne-Marie, you was screamed so loud that I had to keep you quiet. I put my hand over your mouth and nose until you passed out. You knocked me unconscious. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't report you to the police right now. Well, in the beginning, our neighbours thought you were involved somehow. So I and Dave believed that it was best if we kept you away from it all and protected you from the gossip. But the police and the neighbours deserve to know that she has died and to stop hoping for her return. Let her rest in peace. Where did you bury my daughter? He falls at my knees and begins to beg me. Please don't tell the police or anyone, hun, because they will target you as they did before. I'll think about it. But you have to take me to where you and Dave buried her. Okay, first thing in the morning. And seeing as you and Dave are so close and good at keeping terrible secrets, you can stay at his tonight and pick me up in the morning with him. Later that night, after sending him packing, I'm still fuming and so angry. I think to myself, there is nothing I can do tonight, so I may as well go to bed and try to get well rested for tomorrow. As I doze off, I feel the bed begin to sink as if someone was sitting next to me. In my sleepy days, I roll over and say, I thought I kicked you out thinking it was Sam crawling back. Mummy, you will see everything soon. See what? What happened to me, Mummy? Don't worry, I don't blame you. 
blame me. I didn't do anything. I toss and turn all night until the sun's gleam comes through the curtains and the damn alarm goes off. I pull myself up with a struggle, then go over to the curtains and open them. I am filled with envy and anger I felt the day before. How can they have a happy life when mine is torn to shreds? I think I have time for coffee before those terrible men get here. I've decided that after I get the evidence I need, I'm going to call the police and get the justice that she deserves. Only then can I have a proper burial for my beautiful daughter. That's if I can contain myself and not kill them for everything they have taken from me. Before I know it, it's eight o'clock and I hear the car pulling up. I go and meet them outside before they get a chance to speak to me. I order, you do not get to talk to me or wriggle yourself out of this. After the short drive that felt like hours in my mind, we finally arrive. I step out and see a mother and a child playing near little Anne-Marie's old oak tree. They look so happy playing with a skipping rope and having a picnic basket. I feel myself fall into the soft grass beneath my feet and begin to cry. I just cry, my eyes out. As I pull myself up, I feel I just want to scream at them, tell them to get away from Anne Marie's tree. But I realize they have much right as I do. Doesn't mean I have to like it though. I turn to Sam and bark. So where is my little girl? Over there, he solemnly replies. Maybe he has some remorse in him after all. Good, I think to myself. I hope he suffers. I want him to suffer. We walk about five minutes into the wooded area to a ditch and he points down. She is there. He starts to cry. I glare at him. You buried my sweet little angel in a ditch. As I make my way down to her, I see her. Anne Marie is shooting toward me and it's like she hits me in the face. I feel her inside my head. My memories go back to that day and become clear as the sky is blue. It was a really nice day. The sun was shining and not a cloud was in sight. We had our own picnic and she had her peanut butter sandwich and a frisbee. I remember the strange feeling in my mind, like something bad was close. I hear a terrible voice coming from somewhere. Kill her. Kill her. Then I begin to mumble. Kill her. I can feel a deep, deep sadness in my heart. Like another being is inside me. I remember turning to Sam when he asked me, Did you take your medication this morning? I reply, Yes, sweetheart. Though... I don't remember taking it. My mind goes dark. The next thing I know, I have a fallen branch in my hand. Diane, no. I strike Anne-Marie with it, one strong blow. I could hear her skull crack. At the moment, I hear her. It's okay, mummy. I know you are not well. I see the bright light again. Now I'm at the bottom of the ditch, looking up at Dave and Sam. Sam, did I do it? Did I hurt my little girl? Did I kill her? Tell me. Yes, he sobs. You see, we were protecting you. What about the medication? I put it in your coffee every day. And the doctor gives you a booster every month. 
you see, you are ill, but people won't understand. You have been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. You hear voices in which you call them demons. They try to make you do things you wouldn't normally do or say. Diane, we know you would never hurt her intentionally. That's why we had to look after you, protect you. Dave says as he comes towards me. Then I feel him put his arms around me, trying to console me. I want to go home, take me home. In the car, I feel like I should be crying, but I can't. I can hear Anne-Marie and something else. We will be together soon, mummy. Grab the wheel, steer away, kill them, kill them. The demon's voice screams in my ear. I begin to punch myself in the head, sobbing. No, I can't. She's talking to the demons again, Sam. Dave whispers. Sam just sits there, deep in thought. As we approach my house, I dash inside and lock the front door. I grab the biggest kitchen knife I have and calmly walk into Anne Marie's bedroom. I sit on the bed and I can feel her next to me. Mummy, please. Mummy, why are you going to hurt yourself? We will be together soon, but you're not ready. I love you, baby. I place the knife over my wrist. Mummy, no, please don't. I feel the sheer in pain go from my wrist up into my arm as the blood pulses out of my veins. I can feel the life draining out of me. I love you, Anne-Marie. We will be together soon. Bang, bang. I can only just hear someone kicking the front door as I begin to pass out from the loss of blood. I open my eyes, noticing the bright white room around me and the stench of disinfectant. Huh. Um, where, where am I? This isn't my bed. It feels so hard and uncomfortable and I never have just one pillow. The lights are so bright, they're hurting my eyes as I try to force them to focus. A woman in white leans over me. Am I dead? She looks like an angel with a bright light above her and an angelic smile. She looks so warm hearted that I must be in heaven. Hello, you're awake, I see. She exclaims in a gentle voice as she smiles at me. Am I dead? Where is my daughter? I was hoping we would be together again. Tell me where Anne-Marie is. I can feel that I'm getting agitated. I'm Nurse Barb. You are in the state hospital and the state decided you had to be here. Why am I? in the state hospital not the general hold on isn't this the loony bin have I been here before I can't remember Diane let me just get the doctor he will explain I want to see my daughter I yell I'm full of anxiety and sadness she just walks away and leaves me alone I am sure I have been here before I just can't remember when. What was I on? Sam told me that I was on medication. But what medication? I wonder how long I have been here. How long was I on meds? I better sit up and get dressed before the doctor gets here. Ouch. My arm. I look at my arm. What the? Well, I know that's a drip. But what is the other one? Who the hell is that? There is a completely bald, scrawny man sitting in a chair in front of me, just staring at me and rocking. 
Um, hello? I ask shyly. Haha, you see me, don't you? I am dead. What the hell? I pull my cover up over my face. I'm just going to lie here, hoping someone will come soon. Help me find my daughter and get me out of here. About 15 minutes later, I hear a man's voice. Danny, why are you sitting there? You're scaring our new guest, Diane. Now you can go back to your own room. Time to sit up and see who that is. If it's another person saying they're dead, I'm going to pull these things out of my arm and run. As I sit up, I see a tall, formal looking man. He's in a sharp suit, with a few pens in his pocket. Has short hair with a well-groomed beard, and is holding a clipboard. Morning Diane, how are you? I feel like crap, but I don't care. All I want is to see my daughter, all in good time. But first, I'm Dr. Carter. You have been here a few days now. You were at the General Hospital and they had to keep you sedated while they fixed you up. Then they discharged you into our care. But why? Why would they do that? Well, my dear, you did slit your wrists and kept screaming for your deceased daughter. So the hospital felt it would be best you stay with us for a while. I lay back down thinking this can't be happening to me. What about Sam? Ah yes, your husband. He wasn't too happy with you being here either. He was so adamant that he has to take you home to look after you. But we had to do what is right for you. So what is this in my arms then? That's a mix of antibiotics to stop your wrists getting infected. Anyway, I must go, finish my rounds. I'll let you rest, but I will be back later. Okay, so they put me in the loony bin and yet they leave me here with nothing to do but stare at the ceiling. Now that will drive me insane. Was I seeing Anne-Marie, or was it in my head? But it felt so real. It had to be real. I could feel my eyes getting very heavy. What are they really pumping into me? Mummy, wake up. I miss you. I shoot up in a start. Anne-Marie, you're here. I look across the room and I find she is nowhere to be seen but I'm sure I heard her. Then I realise apart from the light creeping in, through the crack of the door, it's pitch black. Wow, they must have really knocked me out. As I lay down, I come to the realisation that I must have been dreaming. It doesn't take me long to doze back off to sleep. You must escape. You must Hurt yourself and those awful doctors. That voice, I'm hearing it while I'm awake and now in my sleep. I can see this horrible looking thing. Just its face though. It has blood red eyes and scars all over it. Combined with the most horrific smell. Like death. I can feel tightness around my arms. I'm getting shaken. I'm feeling scared and begin to cry. Mummy, time to wake up. Wake up, Diane, wake up. I wake up screaming in sheer terror and clutching onto someone's arm. Are you okay? You were dreaming. It's the nurse. She's back again. Help me. It wants me to hurt you, but it can't hurt you. Just remember that, and you won't hurt us. You're just a little bit confused. Now you must lie down and try to get some rest. I will make a note of tonight for the doctor. I can feel the pressure on my shoulders as she gently nudges me back down to my pillow. I must have fallen back to sleep because the next thing I know... Morning, mummy. Can I have a glass of orange juice and toast for breakfast? 
Now I know that was real. It was so clear that I jump up only to be blinded by the bright daylight coming through the window opposite my bed. But still no visual sign of Anne-Marie. I feel like I'm getting more and more confused. Maybe I am crazy after all. (laughs) Haha, good morning. I look up as my eyes begin to focus. Oh no, it's Mr Crazy himself, Danny. Well... I think that's what the doctor called him. What do you want now, mister? I am dead. My voice is filled with sarcasm. I can't be bothered with him this morning. All I want is to get out of here. I just wanted to tell you that you are like me. We are here forever. Till Saint Pete opens the pearly gates. And there he goes, running out of the door. Wow, what a loon. He really does need help. I look up to the clock on the wall. 7.30am. Really? It's that early? How long has that crazy person been in my room? Hello again. I bet you thought I had left for the pearly gates, hadn't you? Hoped. More like... I reply, feeling frustrated, that he has come back to torment me. Doesn't he think I'm going through enough? You must bite him, make him bleed. The voice in my head screams, getting louder and louder. It's making my head and my ears hurt. No, I can't, I just can't. Yes, do it. Do it now, or I will make you suffer. Okay, okay, I'll do it. But I'm not hurting anyone else. Just one little bite and I will leave you alone. Here, Danny, come here. Just as he gets next to me, I lunge at his arm and bite on his wrist, feeling the warm blood squirt into my mouth. I begin to chew on his wrist as hard as I can, swallowing the blood as I go. I am sure he's screaming but all I can think about is hurting him, to kill him. Diane, stop! I can feel the nurses and doctors trying to pull me down and force me to release my grip. I feel a sharp pain in my arm. What have they injected into me that makes me let him go? I come to the sudden realization of what I have done. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. He told me to do it. He wouldn't shut up. He made me. I start to feel faint and dizzy. I feel like I'm going to pass out. I hear its voice again. They are the crazy ones, not you. You must do more to escape. I have your daughter. Ha, <laughs> ha. I wake up again and try to rub my eyes. But my arms... I can't move my arms. Why can't I move? As I inspect my arms to find the reason, I discovered they have used some leather cuffs to tie me to the bed. Why would they do that? I call out for a nurse. Nurse, nurse, help me. She comes rushing in. Look, Diane, you did a terrible thing earlier. We had to restrain you for your safety and everyone else's. What? What did I do? You bit Danny's wrist. He's lucky to be alive. You tore a real chunk out of him. He's at the state hospital getting surgery. No. No, I didn't. I would never do such a thing. Would I? Well, you did. Look, just rest. We will help you to get over this. As she leaves me alone again, I can feel the side of the bed sink, just like if someone is sitting there. Mummy, I drew you a picture today. Did you, baby? Of what? The man with the scars. He smells too. What do you mean? You can see him. Yes, mummy. 
He told me he wanted to play hide and seek. He will find you and get you. No, no, please, no. Look, Anne-Marie, you must run and hide. Don't let him see you. Please stay away from him. He is a bad man. She's gone again. What is happening to me? I have to speak to Dr. Carter and find out if this is in my head. Hello, Diane. Have we calmed down now? Yes, Dr. Carter. But what is happening to me? Well, you are suffering from psychotic episodes with hallucinations. You will have to take the medication you are given and in a few days we will discuss the next steps. I am not psychotic, doctor. Mummy, listen to the doctor. Shh, Anne-Marie. Who are you talking to, Diane? Oh great, he heard that. Now what am I going to say? He is certain I am crazy. I have just given him everything he needs. I may as well explain now that I cannot hide it. I am talking to Anne-Marie. Can't you see her? She's standing right there in front of you. He tilts his head slightly. Um, that's interesting. He begins to write on his clipboard and then gets up and walks out. I can hear him talking to the nurse, but I can't quite make out what they are saying to each other. So, what happens now? Looks like I'm here for the foreseeable future. My wrists are starting to hurt from the leather cuffs. They feel so tight. When are they taking these off? I should have asked the doctor. But all he cares about is proving I'm crazy. I don't think he is going to be much use to helping me. Time is dragging on so badly in here with nothing to do but think about what is happening to me. When would I be allowed to have visitors or make a phone call? I'm starting to feel like my thoughts are all over the place. I cannot seem to settle on a single thought. I hope Danny is okay. I know he is a complete nut job, but I didn't want to hurt him, especially as bad as they say. You're going to die in here, Diane and I will keep your daughter with me. No, no, not this again. Just leave me alone. I have not done anything to you. The fear is creeping up on me. I just want to escape this horrible, tormenting voice. I can feel my eyes filling with tears and my legs are shaking from fear. I don't care what they say, he is real. And so is my daughter's voice. They can't change that. The nurse pops her head in the door. Are you okay in there, Diane? Yes, nurse, I'm fine. But when will you take these cuffs off me? Maybe later. You just settle down. Settle down? Who does she think she's talking to? I'm not a five-year-old little child. I just lay there and close my eyes. Instantly, my memories of that day come back to me, but they're different than before. Instead of them being bright and happy, they're dark and gloomy. Instead of sunshine and peanut butter, it's rain clouds and a soil sandwich. My little girl's face has changed too. It's now a demon with scars all across his face. That putrid smell of death and sulfur surrounds me. I feel the terror creep into my mind, body and soul. For a few seconds I freeze, not knowing what to say or do. All I can think about is that this thing is going to hurt my sweet little girl. As I look down, I see the fallen branch. Time slows down, like it's all in slow motion. The thing is laughing at me, so I grab the branch and with one big swing, I crack it across its skull, screaming, I want my daughter back, 
give her back. Before I know it, I'm safe in my bed at home and I'm being given the news that my daughter is missing. Now awake in my hospital bed, I know when the lies must have started. Sam really did protect me. I just didn't know it. I have treated him so unfairly. He didn't deserve it. But at the same time, if I had known, I wouldn't have been that bad. I need to talk to him. I need to tell him that I'm sorry. As soon as the doctor comes in, I'm going to demand a phone call. Mummy, do you understand now? Yes, darling, I understand. And I'm so sorry. It looked so real. Mummy, please stop crying. I didn't even notice I was crying. All I can feel is my heart wrenching in my chest. All I can feel is my heart wrenching in my chest. I feel broken, a shell of a person. Don't leave me, Anne-Marie, as I wipe the tears from my face. I see the good doctor at the bottom of my bed with his trusty clipboard ready to judge me. How is Anne-Marie today, Diane? He's really pushing his luck, asking about her. I suppose I better answer him before he starts to try and grill me more. Yes, she is fine. Look, doctor, I need to make a call. Can you undo my cuffs, please? I need to make a call. Diane, if I were to do this, I would have to bring the phone in here and you have to be good and not hurt yourself or anyone else. Yes, I will be good. If I feel anything, I'll call the nurse. Okay, I'll get the phone. Thank you, doctor. A short while later, the nurse pops in with the phone and lays it gently on the bed. As she undoes my cuffs, I realize she doesn't seem her happy, cheery self. She looks worn out, exhausted. Curiosity gets the better of me and I query I bet you cannot wait till the end of your shift. No, I can't, she smiles. But as she walks out the room, I hear her mutter, I wish my shift would end. I haven't been home in days. Poor girl, I think to myself, they're working her to the bone. Anyways, time for my phone call. As I nervously dial Sam, I wonder and hope he wants to talk to me. Hello. It was great to hear his voice again. Hello Sam, I need to talk to you. Oh Diane, how are you? I am okay, I guess, but I need to explain everything. I understand now. As quick as a flash, he answers. Don't worry, Diane. Look, I'm rather busy. Can you call back tomorrow? Um, yes, I think so. Okay, bye. Before I get a chance to tell him bye, or I love you, he has hung up the phone. Why didn't he want to talk to me? Doesn't he think I miss him? Doesn't he care about me? I almost throw the phone on the end of the bed. I'm out of temper and call the nurse to let her know that I have finished. Eventually she comes back in for the phone and finally some food. I haven't eaten in days because of this drip. Diane, I need to take out the drip. It may sting a bit. I nod in agreement, but turn away from her. I don't like this sort of thing. Needles, drips, blood, and anything medical makes me cringe and shudder. All done, Diane, and here is your food. Mashed potatoes with a pork chop and cabbage. Well, I will have to take her word for it. It looks like something the dog brought up. I slowly pull up the fork to my mouth. Yuck. It tastes as bad as it looks, but that's not going to stop me. I'm starving. I soon clear the plate, thank goodness. I finish that. I hope tomorrow's food is better. 
Mummy, can you sing me a bedtime song, please? Without a second thought, I begin to sing her favourite song. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. I can feel a nice warm feeling in my heart. It's been so, so long. For the first time in a very long time, I can feel myself smile. But before I could get more into the song and enjoy this moment, I begin to sense something. I can smell the stench of death again. I hear the voice in my head. I'm going to burn you all and torture Anne-Marie. She will be mine to torture forever. No, I won't let you hurt her or anybody else. I will stop you no matter what. I would rather die before I let you hurt her. The room goes dark and silent again. I can tell I'm alone now. Later that night, the nurse brings her head around the door and reaches for the light switch. Night, Diane, get some rest. Plunged into darkness, I lay my head on my hardest nails, single hospital pillow. I mean, whoever sleeps with one pillow. Slowly, I close my eyes, hoping I can get some real sleep tonight. However, all too soon, I'm woken by my own screams of terror, with tears like a river flowing down my face. I'm holding on to the nurse's arm. What is wrong, Diane? What are you dreaming about? I can feel the bed moving since I am shaking so much and I am soaked from sweat. I quickly scan the room, lifting the covers and checking all the corners around the room. Once I realise that I am awake and safe, I try to explain to the nurse that my bed is wet from sweat. She places her fingers on her lips, lays me back down and explains the bed change is in a few days. Ooh, I don't think I can put up with it that long. I must have gone back to sleep because the next time I'm awake the sun is gleaming through the window and yet again the doctor is sitting on the end of my bed. He doesn't look as tired and worn out as the nurse. Good morning, Diane. I have brought you something. Because you won't explain your nightmares, I thought you could write them down. What, like a diary? Exactly, he smiles, placing the diary with a blunt pencil on the bed and gets up and leaves. I open the diary. I suppose I should give it a try. They won't like the first entry. But they want to know what I'm dreaming about. I check the clock on the wall. Entry 1. It's 9.30am. I would write the date, but I don't know it. Dear diary, last night I had the most horrific dream. I dreamt that I and my special little girl was singing nursery rhymes. She was sitting at the bottom of the bed. Suddenly, I felt something wrap around my wrists. I was scared, but looked anyway. I saw those leather cuffs tightening against my wrists. They pulled me back and held me down. It's then I see Anne-Marie tied to something, but I can't see what, and she's now crying. He then appears, the scar-faced demon. I have a little rhyme I want to play. He laughs and he, as he's saying this to me. He grabs her foot, puts his thumb and forefinger on her big toe and begins to say, This little piggy went to market. As he says this, he begins to slowly twist her big toe round and round till I can see her skin tear. Blood drips from her toe and my little girl is now screaming to the heavens. He keeps twisting until there is a slow crack of her bone. 
That's when I hear the shuddering sound crawling up my spine. He separates her whole toe from her foot. Scar-faced demon laughs at the sound of her crying. He stares straight into my eyes. You see, Diane, if you don't do as I say, I will finish her. Toes, then feet, then legs, and so on, until I can tear her apart. And tear apart her soul. I'm pleased I have finished reliving this ordeal of writing that down. Well done, mummy. Thank you, sweetheart. I won't let him hurt you. So I close the book and put it at the bottom of the bed. Just as the nurse creeps into the room, I think she's trying not to disturb me from my writing, but she needn't bother. Hello, nurse. No need to creep around. I have finished. She just picks up the diary and sits on the bed, looking like she's going to pass out from exhaustion. Nurse, when was the last time you slept? I inquire. Um, I was supposed to sleep earlier, but we had an emergency. Anyways, you just concentrate on yourself, and she slowly carries herself out of the door. I wonder why she is like this. They don't let her rest, mummy. What do you mean, sweetie? The doctor. He don't let any of them rest. That's awful. Just then, as if by magic, the doctor walks straight in. He stares at me, with his head tilted. I wish he would tell me what on earth he wants. Look, Diane, I've read your diary, and I must say, it's a bit over the top. It's true, Doctor, that's exactly what I dreamt. Kill him, Diane. It would... It would be so easy. Without even thinking, I lunge at him with unnatural speed, grab him around his neck and squeeze. I keep squeezing until I can feel two men pulling me off. The doctor yells at them. Two words, padded cell. They just nod and drag me to the cell. Here I am in the padded cell. It is completely dark. The only light I can see is from the hole in the bottom of the door. I guess for them to slide my food in. This is going to drive me nuts. The room stinks of... Oh no. He is here. The demon. I can hear him laughing. But it sounds like it's moving all around me. I need a cuddle, mummy. I reach my arms out for her. But I can't find her in the dark. I have her. Oh, no, what am I going to do? I can feel a pinch on my toe. It begins to tighten. Oh, God, no. I try to let out a scream, but nothing comes out. I am gagged by the smell and my fear. The scar-faced demon appears right in front of me. He is laughing at me and still twisting my toe. Ah, the pain is so incredible like I've never felt before. I can feel the bone breaking and the muscles tearing until, snap, the whole toe comes off. That's when I can finally scream. But just as I open my mouth, the horrible demon holds it open and shoves the toe in my mouth and forces me to swallow it. I can't believe this. This has to be real. I can taste my own toe. I can feel it stuck in my throat. I can't swallow it. My throat tightens and I begin to choke, gasping for air. I cannot breathe. I begin to kick the door, trying to get someone's attention, but to no avail. I can feel my face begin to turn blue. I am going to die. With one last big kick at the door, I fall onto my back, 
my eyes begin to feel as heavy as a truck. Mummy, no. Please, Mummy, be okay. Mummy, please help me. He's got me. Help. At that moment, the door opens and it's the nurse. And that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thanks for listening. If you liked this story, then subscribe and click the like button and tickle that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at Home of Scares. Now, good night, my little hellhounds. Yeah, that's awesome.